past one and a half days, we have had the opportunity to deliberate on how authoritarian regimes have become aggressive in exporting repression beyond the borders and how the consequences are no longer local but global. And amidst all this, all of us here today share and believe in something fundamental and universal, that freedom and justice transcends boundaries and borders, and it is not exclusive but inclusive. Yet China continues to suppress those very values we hold universal. Freedom House report lists Tibet as being one of the least free countries for the seventh consecutive years since 2015, and Reporters Without Border ranked China 177th out of 180 countries as being the least free in freedom of press. China continues to maintain an iron grip on Tibet, East Turkestan, Mongolia, and Hong Kong. Taiwan, likewise, is daily confronted with series of threats by China. With the ongoing conflict between Ukraine and Russia, it is only more the evident that silence is certainly not the answer. The world should come together to confront any form of authoritarianism because consequences are no longer local but global. We see a growing number of nations coming together in their assertion to challenge the China's influence. Quad and AUKUS are but a few manifestations of this growing call. In one of the researchers, <laughs> Pew Research Center highlighted how China's global image now is in a complete downfall with 69% as unfavorable. And it is with these in mind that it couldn't have been more crucial than having this very important session today, common ground to face common challenges. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jigdel, and I'm a member of the Tibetan Parliament of the Tibetan government in exile. And it's my honor to chair one of the final yet important sessions of this convention. We have four esteemed panelists before us today who will be sharing their experience and views in forging a common ground against a common threat, that is China. You will notice that in the program we have one more speaker, Mr. Engbat, Executive Director of Southern Mongolian Human Rights and Information Center, who couldn't be here due to family priorities. Each panel here will have 10 minutes for their presentation, following which we will, we will conclude the session with 10 minutes Q&A. On this note, without further ado, we have Honorable Taiwanese legislator uh, Lim Tiong So, dearly known as Freddie amongst the Tibetan, as our speaker, uh, to introduce Honorable Freddie Lim, the lead vocalist of the Taiwanese medalist Katonic, was, which was elected as a member of the Taiwanese parliament in 2016, making him the first medal star to become a parliamentarian. However, he made history not only because he became the first medal star in the parliament, but also because he has successfully overturned a constituency that had long been held by a senior parliamentarian affiliated with the KMT with an authoritarian tradition. In 2020, after a hard battle, he won his re-election. In the parliament, Freddie is a member of the Foreign and Defense Committee. He actively part participates in parliamentary diplomacy, expanding Taiwan's link with the international community while resisting China's pressure. All, at the same time, he devoted himself in pushing for trans transitional justice and human rights. What Freddie does as a parliamentarian echoes the work of Katonic. Besides, he also pushed for the Bill on Marriage Equality, Gender Equality, Cultural Policies, and Justice Between Generation. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, what we have on Freddie, and Freddie, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, I'm Freddie Lim. I'm very honored to be here to share my point of view. I'm very happy to be here as a part of this con a great convention. Very fruitful and very constructive. Uh, a lot of opinions have been, has been exchanged in the last one and a half day. And uh, uh, first of all, I uh, first of all, I think I want to share with you what I, uh, we have done. I've been just like the uh, host uh, Tenzin has shared with you. I've been elected to the parliament in 2016, and so I want to share with you what we have been doing since then. Uh, I think most of you, you, you have already known that Taiwan is a democratic country, and, but maybe just some of you uh, might be aware of the authoritarian history or background of Taiwan. So the, the previous authoritarian uh, party, which is called uh, Kuomintang, 
Chinese Nationalist Party. Uh, he, uh, they used the, the uh, Sino, Sino-centric ideology to rule Taiwan. So they brought the uh, institution and the government, de uh, governmental departments from China to Taiwan. So there are a lot of uh, governmental uh, departments still remain their uh, Sino ideology, which, uh, for for instance, like the uh, what is it called, the Mongolia and Tibetan Affairs Committee is still in has been in Taiwan for dozens of years, for decades. So uh, it has been there even uh, till after Taiwan's uh, democratization. It's still been there. And after 2016, and I have formed, uh, uh, let, me, let, let me explain more. Like, I, I think some of, some of you might know that the Mongolia and Tibet uh, Affairs Commission means that it's an inner issue of our government. It's a domestic issue of our government. It's under the domestic policies making committee in the, uh, in the parliament. So it brought the tension and sensitivity between Taiwan's government and the uh, uh, Tibetan government in exile for decades. So after 2016, when I got elected, I formed the uh, parliamentary group for Tibet, and I uh, followed the continuing the work of the predecessors. Uh, we pushed very hard for abolish that, commi uh, that commission. And in 2017, we successfully we abolished the uh, commission, and now governmental departments who deal with uh, CTA of, uh, or their representative in Taiwan are under uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, uh, Ministry of Culture. So it depends on uh, which uh, level, uh, which perspective of things are dealing with. So it means that Taiwanese government uh, treated, nowadays treat uh, the Tibetan government equally. So I think it's, uh, <laughs> thank you. So I think, I think it's very important for Taiwan to, because Taiwan has, because the old government, old authoritarian government uh, that uh, escaped from China has brought so many uh, Sino-centric ideology to Taiwan. So there are lots of things to be fixed. And without fixing all these problems, there is no way that the Taiwanese government or officials will treat uh, or consider Tibet equally. So a uh, step by step, we're still working on uh, on something there. And uh, uh, nowadays, we also have our executive branches in the government to take care uh, the uh, Tibetan population in Taiwan and try to uh, because there are a lot of very complicated uh, regulations. So uh, not just not just in the executive branch, but like uh, the my Honor my uh, in the parliament, Hong Seng Han, a legislator, and me. Some of our the legislators uh, in the parliament, we try to work with the uh, Tibetan community very uh, closely and to try to deal uh, fix the problem case by case. And nowadays, we are also pushing for the Magnitsky Act, Taiwan version. So we hopefully I don't know I don't know when it will be done, but there are a lot of difficulties facing. Uh, in the next, um, in these couple of months. So hopefully we will have something uh, happen in the near future. And, uh, and then I think it's uh, something very important that since this session is about common ground to face common challenges, I think we have discussed a lot of, about the, the narratives from the Chinese government or the Chinese information warfare that against all the democracies in the world. So I want to share with you that uh, I think all of us, we agree that they, uh, no matter Chinese government, they try, they are there, they have their information attacks uh, against Taiwanese community or the Hong Kongers or the Uyghurs or the Tibetans or the, all the democratic world. I think <clears throat> I think by the I think Taiwan by by stati uh, statis uh, no, <laughs> sorry statistics Taiwan is now the most serious seriously attacked country uh, by the Chinese disinformation attacks. It's uh, a research from Swedish government. So 
There are all kinds of uh, disinformation attacks that happen everywhere from Chinese government, but the front line is in Taiwan. And uh, I, think, I think it's not just because China wants to infiltrate Taiwan, but it's because Taiwan is, more, is the most important hub of Mandarin information world. So there are uh, the, when the Chinese government want to infiltrate Taiwan or attack Taiwan with their disinformation tools, not just because they want to control Taiwan, but they want to control the Mandarin speaking world. They want to control whoever got the message in Mandarin. So, so which means, which means they attack Taiwan not just with the, uh, not just they want to sabotage the Taiwanese uh, domestic politics, but also they try to sell the wrong uh, narratives, the wrong stories of Tibetans, wrong stories of the Uyghurs to Taiwanese, and through those pro-Chinese extremists in Taiwan to s spread that kind of stories to the world. So I think in this uh, scenario, in this, uh, follow this kind of idea, follow this kind of uh, census, uh, this kind of sense, I think uh, it's very important to how we stand firm uh, in the front line to fight against the Chinese disinformation. So that's why I always encourage the NGOs, INGOs all over the world should have their uh, Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific office in Taiwan and not just to support Taiwan, not just to support the, not just to, to, to uh, work on the issue of Taiwan, but also try to work uh, harder to fight back how the how, uh, Chinese government to sell their propaganda in this Mandarin speaking world. And uh, so I'm very happy to know that Wang Dan tried to have his branch, his foundation's branch in Taiwan. I think that's what all the NGOs should do. And especially when there are so many INGOs uh, retreat or withdraw their branches in Bangkok and Hong Kong. So nowadays you must, uh, no matter which NGOs, which INGOs you are working on, if your branch in Bangkok or Hong Kong have already gone, you should move to Taiwan because that's the front line against the Chinese disinformation attacks. And not, not just because, I think, not just because, uh, uh, what should I say? Uh, I think not just because we want our voice to be heard in the political or civil society arena in the Mandarin speaking country, but I want to emphasize that also want to be, you, you can also think in this way that we, there is a, a market, there is a free, uh, freedom of speech market or even a business market opportunities in Taiwan. Uh, I, want to, uh, I want to share some examples with you. First of all, 10 years ago, Amnesty International Taiwan, or wait, back in 2009, Amnesty International Taiwan chapter was a chapter with only one full-time employee. And I served uh, as the president from 2010 to 2014. After nearly 10 years uh, of hard work, I, I'm in the beginning of the four years, and then there are following uh, chair and presidents. We work very hard. Now the Taiwan branch has been supported by, by the stable, small, uh, small amount uh, donate, uh, donors, and uh, it has become a branch with almost 20 employees, almost 20 people there. And Taiwan branch has been one of the fa uh, fastest growing branch among all the branches. So it's, which means that uh, I think there is a, potential that you, you have, uh, because Taiwan is in the front line and Taiwanese people care about human rights and freedom and, and they, uh, Taiwanese people sense the importance of all the causes much more because it's so close, Chinese government, Chinese disinformation attacks are so close. So you can, you, there is a, a millions of people care about the issues that you care about. Maybe those citizens, those Taiwanese people, don't know yet. They might not know about what's happening in the southern Mongolia, not know, don't know about what's happening in uh, Xinjiang with the Uyghur people. 
but they are but they have the potential to know more because there are plenty of people care about human rights and the other thing is that uh, I don't know if you know the Hong Kong documentary called Revolution of Our Times. It's been banned in Hong Kong, of course, but it has won the best documentary in Taiwan's Golden Horse Film Festival. That's the, one of the most important film festival awards. And uh, it used to be controlled by Kuomintang. So it used to be very pro-China. But that documentary movie won the best documentary awards last year in Taiwan. And also the box office went very well. So what I want to say is not, what I wanted to say is not just about let our voice be heard, but also if you are seeking to enter a market where there are business opportunities with values, I think Taiwan is a good opportunity. Because I've always believed that our mission needs to penetrate into various aspects of life, such as e economy and culture and all different levels of lives. So I think it's very important. Even in Taiwan's music festivals, you can see Tibetan booths there, Amnesty International booths there. And hopefully, I hope in the future, we can see the Uyghurs booths there and the Southern Mongolian booths there and more uh, different human rights issues with their uh, INGOs can have their branch in Taiwan. And it's not just because we need Taiwan to stand firm. I think it's, it can let the fight between the free world and China, uh, we, can, we, can, we can reposition the, our way of the fighting because Nowadays, it's like we, we are fighting in a defensive position. But there, there are plenty of Chinese students that they want to read information with VPN across their firewall, great firewall, to read information on Taiwanese internet. So which means that if you, brought, if you bring your truths, your stories, your works in Taiwan with lots of pro, uh, professional translators and, uh, and uh, uh, video producers and all the different services you need in Taiwan, we can fight back. We can sell our stories to those Chinese students, Chinese stu uh, people who read the, t the Mandarin information produced from Taiwan. So I think that's very important that we try to, to not just consider Taiwan as the front line, but let's fight together in the front line. So last but not least, I think, uh, I just want to, I, I just want to re, I, I just want to uh, let you guys to reconsider how Taiwanese market is like. Taiwanese, uh, there are 25 million people in Taiwan, which equal to five Scandinavian countries. So, how can I say? It looks small compared to China, but with population, it equals to a middle-sized country. So th there is opportunity, uh, uh, not, less, not that small market, and we, I hope that we can fight together in the front line, and I believe that uh, we will win this fight uh, against China. Bakalo. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. <clears throat> Thank you, Freddie, for uh, underlining China's <coughs> hegemonic am ambition to its uh, information warfare and why it is equally important to incorporate values in all aspects of our life and why Taiwan is also an important uh, opportunity and how Taiwan is also one of the first fronts against China's oppression. Uh, next, we will have uh, Dokun Issa, who is the president of the World Uyghur Congress. Um, Mr. Dokun Issa is a former student leader of the pro-democracy demonstration in East Turkestan in 19, uh, 1988. After having endured persecution at the hands of the Chinese government, Issa fled China in 1994 and sought 
asylum in Europe and acquired German citizenship in 2006. Currently, he is the president of the World Uyghur Congress. He has consistently advocated for the rights of the Uyghur people and has raised the issue in the United Nations, the institutions of the European Union, and in individual states and other international fora. In 2019, he received the World Democracy Award from NED on behalf of the World Uyghur Congress. Tokun, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tenzin. Well, first, uh, it is my honor to be attending uh, this event. And uh, uh, I'm not alone. I came here with my colleague together, Mr. Omer Kanat, who is the executive uh, chairman of the World Uyghur Congress. He is here. Rushan Abbas, his campaign for Uyghurs. She is here. And the Abdul Hakim study for Uyghurs. He is uh, here with one Uyghur delegation attending uh, this important event today. And I would like to thank the Tibet Parliament in Exile uh, speakers, Honorable Speaker Sonam, uh, and also my good friend, President uh, Penpa Seren, uh, for inviting me to join this important conversation. And also, it is particularly for organizing this panel, Common Grown to Face Common Challenge, is one of the most significant questions that are of concern of Tibetan, Uyghur, Hong Kongs, uh, and in Mongolia and the other, who are fighting every day to protect their most basic human rights and freedom. The situation for all people living on the Chinese Communist Party rules has deteriorated dramatically in recent years. For those who territorials are occupied by the Chinese Communist Army. This means unbearable repression and forced assimilation. While repression has always existed un under the rule of the CCP, the situation has become much worse under the rule of the Xi Jinping. Any perceived difference from the Han Chinese majority is perceived as a threat to the national interest by the Chinese government and is an attack. Everything that makes all people or community unique is uh, being subject to and assimilation. Uyghur, Tibetan, Hong Kong, and the Southern Mongolia have been targeted in the particularly due to their ethnicity. Chinese government has tried to erode and undermine their unique language, history, culture, religious, and ethnic identity in a bid for more complete control. In Turkestan, in Tibet, religious, cultural, historical sites are being demolished by the CCP. Children are being indoctrinated for forsake for their ethnic ethnicity. The basic right freedom of as, as this group are being de denied or stripped from them. And the symbolize of the democracy of meaningful voice society being ruthless stamped out. The problem has become existential as the CCP commit numerous activity or achieve the goal of social reengineering and assimilation. Currently, more than 3 million Uyghur, Kazakh, and the other Turkish-speaking peoples arbitrarily detained in the concentration camp. Whereas they're subject to killings, torture, sexual abuse, rape, and the forced labor. In my, May 2018, 2018, I have lost my mother in one of the concentration camps. She was 78 years old that time. My mother, father died in a circumstance situation. I still know what time, when, what situation he passed away. My young brother was sentenced to life in the prison. My older bro brother, he is a mathematics professor. Some resources say sentenced 24 years, some say 17 years. However, he disappeared since 2016. My case is not unique. Here is a Rushan Abbas, I told my colleague, my long-time friends. Her sister, Gulshan Abbas, she sentenced 20 years. You know? And Abdul Hakim, my uh, friends, he's more than 30 family members 
in the concentration camp and disappeared since 2016. So since 2017, we all Uyghur community, United States, Europe, around the world, we have lost contact with the family member. Only some such a horrible news, horrible situation was happening at family found us view some way. Around one million Uyghur children separate from the, the parents, forcing them to denounce their ethnic identity, subjecting to them political indoctrination. Hong Kong or others witness, we are witnessing the right and the autonomy being stripped from them. Tibetans are saying the cultural identity environment are being erased from them. Recent events have made clear that what happening to one community in a one region affect to others as well. Checkpoint and other repressive measures tested on Tibet were later used in Turkestan. We all know Cheng Cheng Go. Cheng Cheng Go was the party secretary in Tibet from 2011 to 2016. Then later, 2016, he was appointed party secretary in Turkestan. Then after our, uh, and, uh, 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 being the party secretary in Turkestan, he used the repression and the experience from Tibet, then strong, uh, more uh, restriction uh, to the Turkestan. Security and the surveillance technology tested on the Uyghurs, and the noise being used in the Hong Kong, Tibet, and the other place. Even now, more than 20 countries import Chinese and uh, this surveillance technology. China campaign on assimilation southern Mongolian should have been grave warning. Taiwan is subject and the constant threatens and the intimidation by the Chinese government. Ch Taiwanese sovereignty is under threatens by the CCP. The Uyghur tribunal, within 18 months, the Uyghur tribunal was set up a famous UK uh, lawyers who was a former uh, chief prosecutor of uh, Milosevic. Uh, he set up uh, September 2020. The Uyghur tribunal within 18 months reviewed over 500 witness testimony and 100,000 page document. And finally, 9th of December 2021, it is honest, it is judgment that Chinese government atrocity against Uyghur meet and also for the genocide and the crime against humanity under international law. The US government and the nine national parliament recognized Uyghur genocide motion so far. Just uh, June 9, just uh, two weeks ago, European parliament in Strasbourg adopted a resolution recognizing this crime as a high risk of genocide and crime against humanity. Despite mounting evidence of the Chinese government's abuses, the international community has been slow to act, has not yet taken appropriate actions. However, response from the United States has been more robust. In the past two, year, uh, two years, two important bills were passed and signed into the law, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act and the recent Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. This act went into implementation just two days ago, 20, uh, 21 of June. European Union, US, Canada, and UK coordinately, coordinately sanction for the, uh, Canada as well, yes, and the four CCP officials who are complicit in the crime in Turkestan. But it is not enough to stop ongoing genocide in Turkestan and atrocity crime in Tibet, Hong Kong, and the Southern Mongolia. This underlines and significance of the topic that we are discussing today. In the, this face of the such atrocities, it is united and the solidarity which gives strength to in, endure this kind of the suffering. Atrocity committed against our community have brought us together. Chinese government knows this and they keep trying to break the bonds that united us. We should not let this happen. As we know, China today spent $16 billion uses money to trying to split 
and the united and the, against the uh, opposite group. The Chinese government very successfully, among them Chinese democracy movement. All we know, Wang Dan is here. 1989, up to the Tiananmen massacres, you know, whole world strong solidarity with the Chinese democracy movement, Chinese students. But no, we haven't seen such a strong support. Today, Chinese democracy movement split a lot because CCP used a lot of energy, spent a lot of money, used 50 cent party, used social media, you know, and buying the media internationally and use software and the cooperation with Western countries among the European United States, the academic level, use different of tactic, trying to split and, in, and the implement and, and the, uh, undermine uh, uh, this uh, community. So finding a common ground to speak with unified voice in need more than ever. Over the past few years, World Uyghur Congress has recognized this need and has an enormous occasion work together with organizations, representatives, this, this communities, communities. This campaign that we have done with Tibetan, Hong Kongers, Taiwan, and others have been some most successfully. Our community cam campaign together against the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympic Games globally. A part of the no Beijing, no Beijing 2022 campaign with consistent of the hundreds of organizations worldwide, we had achieved remarkable success. The global the actions through which our com communities and all around the world condemning Chinese human rights abuse with one voice shows that we are united however we are. As a result, of this coalition campaign, international community and the citizens worldwide knew about the, the human rights atrocity happening in China. They are know that it was unjustifiable to reward Chinese government with such a persecutious event. And in the end, with the mountain pressure, Beijing Winter Olympics opening ceremony received record low ratings in the history. We also come together during the recent visit, UN High Commissioner for the Human Rights, Michelle Bachel, to China in Turkestan. This visit was shameful. Together we organized a large demonstration in front of the, her office in Geneva. Before her visit, we sent joint letter asking for her re resignation. Last week, during the 50s of the Human Rights Council section, she announced that she will not seek a second term. Our campaign had an impact. No more than 400 international organizations, civil society, labor union, and, and set up the coalition to end Uyghur forced labor. As you know, today is 85% cut on from the forced labor, from Uyghur forced labor in China. Globally, 22% cut on come on forced labor from the Uyghur forced labor. So, so we have to know how we can cooperate globally to slow down China's economically growing up. Is Chinese government is shameless in this authority, we, we know. So it is the Chinese, because today China is the economic, second economic power. If we continue silence or not cooperate good enough, China is economic growing up, maybe up to 30, 20 years later. What kind of world we are living? It is not only Tibet, it's not only threatened for the Hong Kong, for the Uyghur. It is the, today, CCP threatens the global democracy, the human rights. As a part of such a common effort, Uyghur, Hong Kong, Tibetan, Southern Mongolian, and all those who yearn for the human rights, democracy, freedom, came together in solidarity and are able to not to and expand their human rights advocacy by funding common challenge as opportunity and by celebrating shared success, we hold power to put and and to crime that are amongst the worst of the 21st century. If we speak together with one voice, international community will not able to 
ignored us. And they cannot say it not, they didn't know. We must stand up together, tell the international community that the, for action is no. If we manage to speak out in this way, I'm confident that future holds the human right, democracy, freedom, and all things our community have been uh, deployed of. Finally, I would like to emphasize two things. One, we should educate the world, world from, the, for, from the experience. Today, so many uh, lawmakers and the intellectuals uh, and uh, some experts saying is Tibet is not part of China. Yes, Tibet is not part of China. Is Turkestan was not, is, is not a part of China, but it's occupied territory, you know. If we not educate this, no Chinese government saying, oh, Central Asia, some Chinese intellectual, Chinese people saying, this Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan in the history is a part of China, no, is claiming this. If world continues silence, definitely after 50 years later, 100 late, years later, and the China can't say, United States is a part of China. So shameless, yes. You know? So that's why we're warning to the whole world, yeah? Secondly, and we say, this is not only Tibet issue. Today, China, as I said, not only uh, threatens of Tibet, it's Turkestan, Hong Kong, world. Today, Chinese Communist Party, it threatens the global democracy, global human rights, and the peace. So we should, should the whole world should li li listen, listen from our experience, and we have to emphasize, we have to teach the whole world, it is a time to action. So far, in the if continue silence, and tomorrow is too late. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dolkun. Thank you for explaining in detail on what is currently transpiring in East Turkestan, including the massive incarceration of the Uyghur people following the arrival of Ten Chuanggo the architect of a repressive model in Tibet, who replicated the model in East Turkestan as well. And especially um, how repression have, has escalated since the arrival of Xi Jinping. And I think herein lies an opportunity for us as a member of parliament, uh, because <laughs> Xi Jinping plans to extend his third term this fall in October. So I think as a member of parliament, we have an opportunity to come out collectively with a strong statement at the least, and therefore, maybe much more later on. Uh, now, the next panel, we are pleased to have uh, Wang Dan, President of China Dialogue. Uh, Mr. Wang Dan, uh, as a student leader in Tiananmen Square protests of 1989, has gone to be a prominent member of the Chinese democracy movement. Starting off as a history student at Peking University, Wang received his PhD in history from Harvard University. Between the two, he was involved in the Tiananmen Square protests placed on a most wanted list by the Chinese government, went into hiding, was arrested, and spent two years in prison before being released on parole in 1993. He was then arrested again in 1995, then sentenced to 11 years in 1996, again being released early this time as an exile to the United States. During his time in the United States, Wang has continued to criticize the Chinese government and call for greater democracy and intellectual independence. Wang, the floor is yours. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, in uh, 2018, I come back from Taiwan and establish a think tank here in Washington, D.C. We call the Dialogue China. And that's what I want. For the future of China, we really need a dialogue, a dialogue between different forces to face the same, same enemy, which is the CCP. Before my, uh, I have some concrete suggestion, su suggestion about how can we uh, unite together to face the challenge. But before that, I want to briefly talk about uh, recent situation happened in, in top level of China's politics. And uh, as you know, recently we have a lot of rumors, information, and we do have some sources to show something happened in Zhongnanhai, I mean, in the, in the core of the power of CCP, uh, because of Xi Jinping himself. Because uh, very bad economic situation and Xi Jinping's COVID 
policy and Xi Jinping's personal ambitions to want to continue his power for the, the third term, maybe the fourth term, there are more and more people, even inside the party, feel dissatisfaction and even angry about Xi Jinping himself. That's, the, that's something happening inside the party now. I, we, we actually do not have very concrete evidence to show that um, probably Xi Jinping cannot continue his power in this autumn. But uh, I think there are two things I'm pretty sure. One is regarding the political situation of China, uncertainty is increasing. Uh, uncertainty is increasing now. We don't know what will happen and when will happen, but we do know some things are happening now. Inside the party, so it's a very good chance for us to think about how can we face the future challenge. Um, one very big crisis is the confidence of Chinese people about the CCP. That's my personal opinion. A lot of people say that the, the, the biggest challenge for CCP is economic situation. I don't think so. I think uh, CCP can pass the crisis of economic uh, crisis, but there are bigger crises is the confidence. This pandemic policy has a, has a psychological impact on all Chinese peoples, but more so on the middle class. It's very important on the middle class. Or some Chinese people who have uh, gained a lot of uh, advantage in the past economic development, we call the middle class. Some Chinese people usually think that if they do not get involved in politics, um, politics may not avoid them. And uh, even in Shanghai, you can say the richest city, Shanghai, people can suddenly face the danger of uh, starving and uh, the possibility of uh, being arrested and beaten. In the past, everyone said that China has a powerful governance tools, mentioning like smart city, Skynet system, Beidou or something. But as a result, now even the delivery of a vegetable become a problem. So um, all of this will make the outside world start to understand China's economic development and achievement differently. And also will make the middle class completely lost their confidence uh, in China's future. It's very important because until now, this middle class were the biggest supporter of the CCP. If they lost the confidence of the CCP, that means maybe the end of CCP's rule is coming. So I think it's, again, we, we don't know what will happen and when will happen, but I do think it may be the time for us to prepare the collapse of CCP's rule. And that's why I want to have some concrete suggestion here. I do not intend to talk about why it is important for different communities to come together to face a com common challenge. Instead, I want to focus on how do we face the common challenge. I would like to read three suggestions here. First, regardless of which communities we are from, we will always have diverse and maybe different opinions. So first I suggest, instead of focusing on our different opinions, we should work our way around those differences and base our work on our common ground. Next suggestion I would like to emphasize that democracy requires actions. If there are no action, there will be no democracy. So what we need to do to take action is to take action together, not just through only gathering together at the Embassy of China or protest. I think we need to work together to seek collaborations through actionable, concrete project. I mean, let's do some project together. 
in order to understand each other. My last suggestion today is I hope the communities from Tibet, from East Turkestan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China, and other places who are facing the common challenge of CCP, let's try to establish a means or tool of communication, something like a roundtable discussions, routine roundtable discussions, to hold discussions on the regular so that we can get to know each other better, at least on behalf of some of Chinese democracy advocates. If possible, I'm willing to take part in such uh, dialogue or conversations. This, uh, these are my three suggestions. Finally, I want to say, of course, we as a fighter for freedom and the democracy, we will support and respect the waiting needs of Tibet people, people from uh, East Turkestan, and the waiting needs of uh, Taiwan people and the Hong Kong people. But we're also looking forward the support from all of you to help us to fight with CCP. Because if there's no regime change happening in China, we will all will be very in, we will be in very difficult situation. So the class of the CCP is very important for us. We support you, and are looking forward, we can get support from you. Same way. Thank you. Thank you, Wong. Uh, thank you for um, underlining how middle class Chinese citizens uh, plays a vital role in securing the confidence of the CCP and why we should therefore prepare for the collapse of CCP and uh, how we can face common challenges by underlining three points, uh, essentially being focusing on our uh, common ground and differences, and secondly, um, working together and uh, more collaboration because democracy requires action, and finally, establishing tools of communication, uh, for instance, uh, requiring regular round of dialogues. Um, on this note, for our final panelists, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Jeffrey Ngo, Hong Kong Democracy Council. And uh, Jeffrey Ngo is an activist, historian of and from Hong Kong. Based in Washington, he is a PhD candidate in history at Georgetown University. His essays have appeared in Time, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Hong Kong Free Press, Descent and Slate. After graduating from New York University, he was a visiting scholar at the University of Toronto in 2017 to 18. He was a longtime member of Demosisto, the former youth political group for, he, for which he served as chief researcher and a standing committee member. He worked for the Legislative Council election campaigns of Oh Nok Hin in 2018 and Nathan Law in 2016. He has also co organized numerous solidarity rallies in both Washington and New York to support Hong Kong's ongoing fight for freedom. Jeffrey, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, well, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Um, I, uh, I, I should say, uh, you know, my friend, uh, you know, initially, uh, you know, uh, my friend Joey, Joey Sue was invited and she's on a work trip. So uh, I'm here, you know, and, and, and some of my friends and colleagues with HKDC are, are in the audience as well as the, at the back, but um, really I'm just uh, here um, speaking sort of uh, as a representative of the, the growing um, Hong Kong diaspora in the U.S. and, um, and there's a lot to learn from, from the Tibetan community and, and um, for, for your generations of, of um, you know, of building that, that community and, and, and your hard work, um, pushing back against the, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, control. Um, since uh, this is a sort of parliamentarian event, I should I should begin by uh, noting that um, while Hong Kong has never been fully democratic, you know we have had a, a legislative council um, since the British colonial period and um, and and after the 1997 um, handover as well uh, until um, you know Beijing intervened uh, last year to reform. I think this is not working properly. Um, until Beijing uh, intervened to um, reform the entire legislative sort of um, system in Hong Kong, and now there's patriots, the so-called patriots-only election. 
Um, so even the limited degree of democracy that Hong Kong has enjoyed uh, with respect to our legislature in the past uh, is really no more. Um, but when, even when there were uh, pro-democracy or opposition uh, representation in the, um, in the legislature, um, I don't really recall um, the opposition camp really having introduced uh, any bills or resolutions in the past, uh, whether before 1997 or after 1997, ref with respect to solidarity with Taiwan, with, with the Uyghurs, with Tibetans. Um, and I think it gets to um, the, the, the core of today's panel, which is about building common ground um, and, and, and to face common challenges. Um, and I would argue that despite, um, despite the fact that these challenges do exist in the present day, uh, it has taken us, you know, us Hong Kongers, uh, many decades to, to realize that we are indeed, uh, we indeed share the same destiny. Um, and that partially explains why, even in the more recent past, um, you know, it was quite difficult for Hong Kongers in Hong Kong to see our common struggle uh, with Tibetans, with Uyghurs, with the Taiwanese. Um, and, um, and, and, and Dokken, you were just talking about the 2022 uh, Olympics. Uh, and I think this is a good, good, good segue into what I, what I think uh, has been an important uh, turning point in terms of all these communities coming together, building solidarity. Um, because a moment that I always like to talk about is the previous Olympics, which was uh, 2008, uh, and the situation was just so so different uh, back then. Um, Beijing hosting the Summer Olympics and actually uh, offered to have some games uh, uh, played in Hong Kong, uh, and for a lot of Hong Kongers to be able to share that excitement uh, of of having a, a part to play in the in the Olympics uh, was evidence that one country, two systems was working, that Hong Kong could share a part of, uh, of China's uh, rise uh, and, 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 and the glory. And, and of course, we now know that that, that was such a, a misguided way of thinking about it. Um, but you know, at the same time when Hong Kongers were celebrating, were, were, were on the side of, uh, of, of, um, of, of the Chinese in terms of, of, of the Olympics, uh, of course, there was the Tibetan uprising in 2008, uh, and so it's it's quite uh, it's quite dramatic to think about how Hong Kongers and Tibetans were basically on opposite sides of the Olympics debate uh, just 14 years ago, uh, and it's taken us a little over a decade, but we've finally reached a point where um, you know we we have managed to find that common ground because we have that shared struggle, and of course, a lot of that um, can be explained by by Xi Jinping's rule uh, and, and crack down on, 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 on these frontier uh, territories. Um, I would say, you know, in the early days of, of the one country, two systems experiment, there were evidence, again, Hong Kong was never democratic, fully democratic, um, but there were evidence that Hong Kong could exercise some degree of autonomy. Um, you know, the immigration department had some um, autonomy in terms of allowing Falun Gong practitioners to enter the territory, for instance. Um, the Monetary Authority had a lot of autonomy in 1998 dealing with the Asian financial crisis. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, even one former chief executive was, was able to uh, try to push back uh, in terms of uh, allowing Beijing to interpret our, our, our constitution, the, the basic law. Um, and so in 2008, a lot of Hong Kongers saw uh, our territory as just, as just distinct. You know, we, we never saw Hong Kong as an occupied territory so much as uh, actually believing that one country, two systems could work. Um, and, 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 that, um, and, and of course that, um, uh, that facade was, was crumbling by 2014, you know, with, with, the, with the umbrella movement and, 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 and with the rejection of, of democracy uh, for the third time by that point uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and, 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 and since 2014, I would say, um, you know, Hong Kongers have begun to share um, increasingly more, you know, with uh, you know, with 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 other communities in terms of how um, how how we are all in this fight together. Um, Freddie, I remember the first time I met you was actually in 2016 or 2017, one of the UN marches in New York, uh, fighting for uh, rep Taiwanese representation uh, at the United Nations. Uh, they do this in in New York every year, um, and you know, we begin to show up to more things like this because uh, we understood that we, we, we cannot uh, um, 
we can we cannot explain Hong Kong's struggles without understanding, um, you know, all these other frontier territories and and, and, and what we are all facing together. Um, and it's just such a such a contrast to you know the 1990s or the 2000s when earlier generations of pro democracy rep uh, representatives in, in in our legislature in Hong Kong, um, you know, never daring to mention Tibet, never daring to mention Taiwan, or, or, or you know. Well, we will mention Taiwan, but of course not in the context of Taiwanese independence. So it's, it's been quite a, you know, it's quite been quite a journey, I would say, in in terms of building that um, that level of um, of um, of solidarity. Um, so um, you know, and, and and now we are at the point of 2022, and um, and and of course last year as well. You know, in terms of um, the 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 uh, anti Olympics campaign, some of you in the audience may have. Uh, been a part of that as well uh, in your own capacities, standing up together um, and, you know, and, and, you know, even back in 2019 in the Hong Kong protests, it was common to see the, the Uyghur flag, the Tibetan flag, uh, the Taiwanese flags, uh, various versions of Taiwanese flags. Some, some people wave the ROC flag uh, to support Taiwan, which is, uh, which is different implications, but some people wave the sort of green island uh, uh, independence flag. Um, you know, you see flags uh, all over in Hong Kong by 2019. You know, with the, with the massive uh, protests against the extradition bill, um, and 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 by last year, you know, when we were all standing up against uh, the the Olympics Games of 2022 uh, in cities all around the world, these flags also showed up, and um, and 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 one of the more sort of uh, iconic images was actually in Athens when when Joey, uh, you know, and 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 our friend Tella from SFT. Um, you know, went went to Athens and, and, and waved the Tibetan flag and and the um, and the revolution of ta our times, uh, Hong Kong flag, the, the black one. So, um, you know, these images just go to show how, again, you know, just as I said, how far um, each of our communities have 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 come. Um, I, I would of course say that uh, you know Tibetans have been have been ahead of ahead of us Hong Kongers uh, for generations in terms of recognizing. Um, that shared struggle, um, you know, Tibetans saw um, the importance of building solidarity. I would argue far, far, far earlier than Hong Kong has realized the importance of that. Um, um, but now that we're here, so I hope you know we can, you know, in terms of moving forward, that that will, um, you know, we we can we can do more advocacy work together and and, and set, stand in solidarity with with one another um, in the future. Um, I, I should end. Um, <laughs> I should end by going back to sort of the more parliamentarian aspects of this. Um, I know Speaker Pelosi and, and, and Chairman uh, McGovern, uh, he's chairman of various committees, but uh, Chairman McGovern from Massachusetts, uh, both of them addressed uh, this conference yesterday. Um, and so um, I would say in the past, in, in, in the US Congress, um, they have seen Hong Kong and, and, you know, and the Uyghurs and Tibet and Taiwan and mainland China as separate um, separate issues, um, you know, far from places fighting their own struggles. Increasingly, in the U.S. Congress, these places are seen as different pieces of the same puzzle, and there's no better way to illustrate that uh, than the America Competes Act, which is currently, uh, as many of you know, uh, in the conference process as the House and the Senate reconcile uh, the different versions of the bill. And whereas in the past there would be a standalone Hong Kong bill or standalone Tibet bill, I mean all these bills are important. Um, but right now what we're seeing is that there, you know, there's like bipartisan bipartisan China package with provisions on the Uyghurs, on Tibetans, on on Hong Kong, and that goes and and on, and on Taiwan with some of the military aspects as well. And that goes to show you because of our work together uh, uh, on the ground, fighting alongside one another, building solidarity among ourselves, we have sent a message to uh, lawmakers around the world in Western democracies that there is a strong case to be made that we have a shared struggle and their response has to reflect that. Um, you know, in the, in the America Competes Act for Hong Kong, there's high-skilled uh, immigration provisions uh, and, and, and TPS status for Hong Kongers. For Uyghurs, there's the priority to refugee status. 
uh, for Tibet, more funding uh, in the State Department for, for, for language, Tibetan language education for uh, personnel based in Beijing because the, the, the consulate in Chengdu obviously closed uh, by the last administration. Uh, more funding for military equipment um, going to Taiwan um, and, and, and plenty of programs uh, for, for human rights, for cybersecurity, for, for various uh, different aspects, uh, you know, with respect to all, all all these places, including, of course, as usual, in in, in mainland China, um, you know, that bill is again the 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 reconciliation process is ongoing, uh, and uh, and and hopefully we can see that passed uh, in one form or another um, as soon as possible. Um, but it ju you know it just goes to show, as I say, um, you know, it's not just about par parliamentarians or representatives, or e popularly elected representatives of each of our places. But even in the U.S., even in the U.S. Congress, uh, we see that um, our shared struggle is, is is reflected by by their work and and uh, and moving forward. You know, uh, you know, we have been working with Uyghurs and with Tibetan friends to support this bill uh, and doing other advocacy work, and uh, and I anticipate that we will continue to do that. And um, and once again, thank you uh, all of you for for all of your good work. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid because we're so over the time and because of time constraint, we won't be having Q&A for this session, so we will have to conclude here. Uh, and I also would like to, on final note, thank you, Jeffrey, uh, sharing your experiences. And uh, it is particularly interesting to note how the Beijing Olympic acted as a catalyst because 14 years before, uh, right in 2018, uh, Tibet and Hong Kong was on the opposite side of the debate, but following 14 years, then we happen to be on the same side of the debate. And of course, um, uh, since 2008, in a matter of six years, um, following Xi Jinping's hardline policies, one country, two system is no longer a reality. And more importantly, uh, the increasing collaboration between uh, Tibet, Hong Kong, East Turkestan, Southern Mongolia, and Taiwan have allowed uh, the lawmakers in the West and uh, U.S as well to increasingly see these collaboration essentially as different pieces of the same puzzle. So on this note, I would like to end the session. Thank you again to all. Uh, thank you, Tenzin Chikdil. Thank you, panelists. Um, so we're gonna move straight ahead with the next uh, program in our session today. Uh, that, uh, that is the revival of international network of parliamentarians on Tibet. Speaking will be the Honorable Deputy Speaker Thomas Hering Tekong of the Tibetan Parliament in Exile. Hi, good evening to everybody. The most esteemed parliamentarians from across the world. It's time to revive a website that has been made in 2009, uh, but then in the course of time due to a change of parliamentarians and uh, due to change of the office bearers, we lost uh, this website in the course of time and when we were, myself and speaker, when we took over the charge of 17th uh, Tibetan Parliament speakers and when we were working towards convening the World Parliamentarians Convention on Tibet, uh, we felt the need that we have to revive this and we tried to figure out uh, uh, how best can we retrieve it. So we reached out to Suring Chambala the ICT Europe uh, had that time. Uh, she too had been re uh, had retired then, and so uh, we had no option but to uh, make it new, and then uh, try to uh, make a, a revival of this uh, international network of parliamentarians on Tibet. Uh, for since yesterday, we were talking about. Uh, sharing of experiences, collaboration, networking, and actions. So to 
have collaboration, to have networking, to have action plans together where each one of us can make contributions and make uh, a position and stand of your own, such a platform is uh, really needed. Therefore, uh, we are going to revive this, uh, uh, this uh, international network of parliamentarians on Tibet. And uh, according to the suggestions from Sering Chambala, uh, if since the parliamentarians keep changing because of the election process, to have a permanent secretariat uh, is very important for the continuity of uh, this networking. Therefore, myself and uh, speaker, we set about together and we thought that the uh, secretary of the Patent Parliament in exile could be the uh, the stable secretary who will try to monitor and network among the parliamentarians. But uh, to have such a, a networking, uh, we need to frame a lot of things about the mission, the purpose, and all. So I'm not going to read out each and everything. Uh, it'll be in your uh, vision. Uh, we are not going to have so much of discussion on this. Uh, there is every room of change, uh, whatever is needed later on, uh, when you go back to your places, and uh, if the missions are not enough, how best can we redo it? Each one of us, we can think about it later on. So this is a tentative draft for uh, all of us. Uh, uh, in the meanwhile, to see that officially we are going to revive this uh, uh, impact with uh, what we call it. So, uh, and uh, about the uh, membership, any parliamentarians, any legislatures who stand in line with the mission of this uh, networking, I mean, each and everyone is welcome. So, under uh, the de uh, Department of Information, we have 13 uh, Office of Tibet representatives, and to them we have Tibet support groups of uh, the parliamentarians, Tibet support groups. Uh, we have uh, parliamentarians, Tibet interest groups. So, uh, according to the position that has been taken in the different respective uh, countries, uh, the the president or the chairperson of that uh, support group will ultimately become the chairperson and the co-chair of the, uh, this uh, website, this uh, networking. And uh, so this is it. Uh, we are not going to take much of the time. So if you look into the uh, broad mission of it, uh, it clearly says about the support of Tibet and Tibetans in our uh, peaceful struggle for human rights, preservation of religion and cultural heritage. And uh, the next thing is to impress upon China to abide by the universal declaration of human rights to resolve the conflict of Tibet through middle way policy. So these are the broad uh, missions that are being stated here, but still this is not the final of it. Each one of us, we can have a say on changing the missions. Uh, so uh, according to the unanimity of how the things uh, go, we are going to finalize it later on. So officially, uh, please allow me to officially revive this, uh, 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 this network. And uh, I also take your consent to upload your photos, uh, your biographies, and especially the video messages that we have, we can uh, upload them there. This network will also have uh, uh, connecting uh, uh, messages of uh, different uh, uh, world parliamentarians conventions from first to the seventh one. So we'll have the full information about the world parliamentarians conventions on this. So uh, with this, I take your consent to have officially revived this uh, website uh, for our common collaboration and networking uh, to f take stand on Tibet and Tibet issues. Uh, so that's it. 
So uh, I think that is done for it. Thank you, Deputy Speaker Domala. Uh, we're going to go straight ahead with our next program. So I would like to ask the members of the drafting committee to please come up and take the stage. Drafting committee members. Yes, please take the stage. Um, so next, we will have the 8th World Parliamentarian Convention of Tibet 2022 Washington, D.C. Declaration and Action Plan, which will be presented by Professor Michael Van Walt, Prague, and the Drafting Committee. So good afternoon to this session. As you're already doing, just please take the time to, how many copies are there? Everybody has copies? No, no. Oh. Yeah, the rest are up there. Oh, all right. We can read. So um, we created this draft in record speed. <laughs> so I want to seek your apologies for, uh, I want to apologize to you for any typos or other things that might be have come because of the speed with which we worked on it. Um, I will uh, read it 
and then scroll, it'll scroll down so that you can read it. I'll do it slowly so that you can read and absorb it well, and then we'll go back to the document, uh, I mean, put it back at the top, and then ask for your any corrections or important comments that you might have. Um, we have decided to make the format a little different from last time, not in the way of a resolution, but more just the sentiment of the, um, of the conference. Um, and so the consequence of that is that there may not be as many very specific action plan uh, particulars, but more general actions that you uh, commit to, to do, to undertake. All right. So it's the Washington DC Declaration, 8th World Parliamentary Convention on Tibet, 21 to 23 June 2022. Delegations of parliamentarians from 28 countries participated in the 8th World Parliamentarians Convention in Washington, D.C. from 21 to 23 June 2022 in person and virtually to review and discuss the situation in Tibet and efforts to resolve the Sino-Tibetan conflict caused by the PRC's invasion of Tibet in 1950 and its illegal occupation since then. They thanked their hosts in the United States Congress and commended them for the path-breaking legislation adopted in recent years on Tibet. The meeting took place as the war in the Ukraine caused by Russia's invasion of that independent country on February 24 was about to enter its fourth month and triggered striking comparisons to Tibet's invasion decades earlier. These invasions, constituting flagrant violations of the most fundamental norms of international law, highlight the urgent need to enforce international law and prioritize safeguarding the rule of law and the promotion of freedom, democracy, self-determination, and human rights throughout the world above short-term economic gain. The participants committed to take action to ensure collaboration among parliaments and with the Tibetan parliament in exile on matters related to Tibet. This includes collaboration with the Interparliamentary Alliance on China and with other interparliamentary organizations and bodies. The International Network of Parliamentarians on Tibet, INPAT, will be revived and where possible, parliamentarians will create Tibetan parliamentary groups in countries where they do not yet exist. The participants call on all parliaments to adopt legislation resolutions or motions, hold hearings and investigations at national and sub-national levels to advance the Tibetan cause in line with this declaration. The participants call on all parliaments to take coordinated action and to hold their governments accountable for upholding international law in regard to Tibet, including by fulfilling their state's obligations and responsibilities under international law to respect and promote the right of the Tibetan people to self-determination, refrain from expressly or implicitly recognizing the PRC's claim to sovereignty over Tibet, treat Tibet as an occupied country and not as part of China, and take coordinated action with other like-minded governments to achieve a resolution to the Sino-Tibetan conflict through dialogue and negotiations between the parties without preconditions. The participants call on all parliaments to take coordinated action to affirm and endorse the exclusive right of Dalai Lama and the Ganden Podrang, the Tibetan people and the Tibetan Buddhist community to select and appoint the incarnation of the next Dalai Lama and other senior lamas and firmly reject the PRC's declared intention to do so as a violation of religious freedom. 
the participants reject the false historical narratives propagated by the PRC and CCP, which claim that Tibet has been a part of China since ancient times, to attempt to justify the PRC's invasion of Tibet and current occupation of Tibet. They call on parliamentarians and parliaments to take coordinated action to expose and counter these false narratives. The participants call on all parliaments to take coordinated action to prohibit corporations from benefiting from forced labor and the exploitation of the natural environment of the Tibetan Plateau. The convention noted the massive environmental degradation occurring on the Tibetan Plateau because of mining resulting in toxic waste, water pollution, deforestation, and the destruction of mountains. Further, more than two million Tibetan nomads have been removed from their traditional lands to allow for this exploitation and resettle in culturally destructive villages. The impact of environmental mismanagement in Tibet extend far beyond Tibet itself with over 50 mega dams planned on the 10 major rivers that rise on the plateau, threatening the water supplies of over 1.5 billion people in countries downstream. Tibet's situation as the world's third pole results in global heating occurring at rates more than twice the world average, which will result in the majority of glaciers on the plateau gone by 2050 with global repercussions. The participants express solidarity with the Uyghurs and Southern Mongolians under PRC rule, the people of Hong Kong and the people of Taiwan under PRC threat, as well as with the Chinese democracy movement, all of whom seek common ground to face common challenges. The participants expressed their continuing support for the democratic achievements of the Tibetans, their commitment to nonviolence, and their efforts to seek a resolution of the conflict with the PRC through the Middle Way approach. So any burning um, questions of, of mistakes or things that have to be added uh, and that you, you do not see reflected in this, in this document. Um, what I'm not looking for is long statements, but just points that you think are uh, essential, they should be added. Note that we want to keep this more or less this length uh, because this will get more attention than a very long document, especially if uh, uh, it's spread among your, your colleagues uh, uh, and, and the public. Yes. I think at the second line, uh, the Eighth World Parliamentarian Convention in Washington, D.C., from 22nd to 20. June, so. Oh, so we won't include the dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just had two yes. days. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's been changed. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Anything else? This is fantastic. We thank you. Yes, ma'am. The, the microphone is coming. Okay. Um, I have a consultation whether we will be authorized to sign it or not. Um, my colleagues and myself, we were invited uh, not through the parliament, but personally. Okay? And Costa Rica, I mean, I agree on what it's there because it's the truth. Okay? I have to clarify that. But we don't have uh, an authorization from our Congress for the representation here. We were invited individually. So that's, I have a question because I cannot compromise our Congress uh, by signing it. That's, that's my consultation, okay? <laughs> I think that is, you're not in a unique position. Uh, I think, uh, as I understand it, parliamentarians that are here 
um, uh, in as so far as this, uh, as this declaration is concerned, uh, endorse the declaration on their behalf as parliamentarians, but they cannot do so on behalf of their parliaments, nor can most do so on behalf of their political party or faction. Uh, so I think you're in the same position as everybody else uh, in that you will, if you agree with what is in here, then um, you, you subscribe to it, then you, you, you vote for it. Yeah, but can you specify that we're doing that in our personal condition? Of course, we're parliamentaries, okay, but uh, we don't want to compromise our, our, our legislative power with something that we do not, we're not authorized to do. So we can sign it as personally. Mm. And we, and I've got a suggestion. That I, I don't think we need to say that you know, we're signing it personally, but I think in the very first line, if we remove delegations of and just start with parliamentarians from 28 countries. Yeah. So that makes it very clear that it's yeah, but there's, the individual Yeah, but there's some obligations to uh, the government also. There's no, certain paragraphs. Think, uh, no, we're calling on our governments. We're only calling on parties and parliaments. Yeah. There's no call to governments. In other words, I, you're, I, you're committing yourself and not any parliament, government. As, as participants, yes. As participants. Uh, we understand what it says and we agree with that. Except we cannot uh, sign something that would oblige our government, okay? No, no, but that's not the intention of this I know, I know, but... And it, that's why every, every um, paragraph starts with the participants. The words yeah. are the participants. So as a participant, this is something you either support or you, or you don't, but... No, I understand. And there's no I ju I'm just being careful, okay, because I want to be responsible, that's all. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, I agree on that, and uh, uh, we have talked, um, my colleagues and myself, that we should go back to our Congress, informed that we were here, and um, tell them exactly what happened, but we need to form a committee within Congress and then be part of that committee and then come up with declarations. I think that's part of the respect that we should be careful about. But of course, I mean, we, we uh, agree as, as human beings, you know, and this is, you're talking about human rights, but there's also, um, there was a paragraph which stated uh, something about the obligation. I don't know, let's see. I think it was one of the last paragraphs. Can you, can you, let's see. Participant reject the false, the false historical narratives propagated by the PRC and CCP. Uh, I think that would, would not, uh, it's not um, something that we can be committed to, okay? So unless uh, there is a, a sentence at the end that said that we, I mean, at least Costa Ricans, we sign in our personal uh, responsibility or something to that effect, okay? Because we need to take this to our country. That's the way uh, our parliament works. The, the most important thing, I think, is this declaration is a reflection of what happened here. That, that's how, that's at least how I see this, a reflection of the discussions we've had and the sentiment here. Um, it is not a legal document that binds you to um, every word that is in this declaration. But if you disagree with what is in the declaration, in other words, if you say, um, I don't agree there's any massive environmental degradation there and I don't want to, to include myself in that. That's a different matter. Um, but I, I get your point 
and uh, let us see how we can how we can deal with that for you. But you don't need to sign. Nobody is signing. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, yeah, I think I saw uh, self determination somewhere there, but I just wanted to kind of bring our attention to. Um, the resolutions adopted in some of the early WPCT conference, including the second WPCT held in 1995 in Vilnius, uh, Vilnius uh, Lithuania. And in one of the paragraphs uh, that I see is, uh, which I see it, perhaps I thought would make some sense to have it included here, is uh, in the second WPCT resolution we have reaffirming the inalienable right of the Tibetan people to self-determination and independence. So I thought maybe uh, that would be a good um, inclusion or food for thought for all of us. Would it make sense, in your uh, opinion, to include something to that effect in the very last paragraph? Because that's where the participants express their support for certain things. So I, I'm just being reminded that there is a, um, I think it's a second paragraph, no, the fourth paragraph. It does say, it does call specifically on um, uh, promoting the right of the Tibetan people to self-determination. Self-determination is mentioned twice. This is the second time. We can add the word inalienable. We could do that um, in there. That's another possible way of doing it. Thank you. So his suggestion, the, the main part of it, First part is included in the first in the second paragraph. That second paragraph is actually the result of his suggestion. Yeah. It was drafted as a as a consequence of it. The other part of it is simply a. Uh, I don't do I have it here with me or is it somewhere else? Tibetan it is a support for the Tibetan Parliament's visit to some European countries. That is a very specific thing that's not doesn't really belong in a declaration. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I will do that if I can find it. But I will do that in a moment. I'll share it in a moment when we finished with the, with the edit. Other points. All right, thank you so much. I would like to thank all the members of the drafting committee for uh, having uh, made their time available and worked together very well to get this declaration done. Uh, and uh, at your request, I'd like to share with you what Senator Marek Hilser, who's left again, was here for a short time because of flight problems, um, had suggested. One was the paragraph that we've included on the Ukraine war. Uh, the second is, um, uh, I'll read it to you. As the invasion of Ukraine and Russian narrative echoes to some extent Chinese military invasion and occupation of Tibet 1950, 
2051, which we've included in the first paragraph. We support the plan of the Tibetan parliament in exile to pay a visit to Europe in 2022-23, and in particular to the Czech Republic and some Eastern European countries. Such a visit would be an opportunity for the Tibetan parliament in exile to exchange views with European citizens and leaders about the importance for Europe to defend its democratic values against authoritarian regimes like Russia or China. So this is, this is essentially a, both a message to the Tibetan parliament in exile, uh, to say that you're, you're more than welcome, and in fact it would be a very positive thing to do, um, but also to those parliamentarians who may be in a position to invite the Tibetan parliament to their countries uh, uh, and, and coordinate so that um, uh, the members of the Tibetan parliament can visit a number of countries at the same time. So can I say that we are adopting this declaration by acclamation, um, taking into account the point that was made by, um, by the parliamentarian from Costa Rica concerning the uh, you know, not binding their government or binding their, their parliament or, or political fraction. Well, thank you. And can we continue the applause? But I'd really like to thank Michael for leading our work. He thanked us, but I would think he's leading the work that he's done on this. Excellent work. I understand that we will distribute this or it will be distributed to everybody um, if that's technologically possible. Um, the edits have been put in. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Professor Michael Van Walt Prague, once again, and the drafting committee. Please give a round of applause to the drafting committee and Professor Michael. Um, so we will have the final program of the day, uh, which will be the vote of thanks by Honorable Deputy Speaker Thomas Hering Teka, Tibetan Parliament in Exile. esteemed dignitaries, before I propose the vote of thanks, I have an announcement to make. Uh, there is a joint declaration of uh, Latin American parliamentarians of El Salvador, Chile, and Mexico. So I call upon uh, John Wright, Johnny Wright to uh, come up and uh, read your declaration. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, joint declaration on the Eighth World Parliamentarian Convention on Tibet. Uh, this is in Spanish, so I'm translating as I speak, so please forgive me if I can't find the exact word. The delegations conformed by the Republic of El Salvador, the Republic of Chile, and Mexico participating on the Eighth Convention of World Parliamentarians on Tibet, and guided by the principles stipulated in the UN Charter to promote the establishment and maintainment of peace and international security, reaffirm our respect to the principle of self-determination of people um, from the protection and guarantee of human rights to the prohibition of the use of force in international relations which is stipulated in the UN Charter. We reaffirm our commitment to the declaration 
that uh, will result from the eighth World Parliamentarian Convention on Tibet, realized in Was uh, uh, that took place in Washington, D.C. in 2022. We recognize the importance for the Tibetan people to become a territory that enjoys its autonomy with the goal to develop economically, socially, and culturally, and organize freely without external intervention according to the principle of equity. Since the uh, decade of the 60s, uh, by initiative of His Holiness the, Dai the 14th Dalai Lama, the Tibetan people initiated a transition to a democratic system based not solely on participation, but guided by love, inner peace, compassion, and truth. Being this a gift to the Tibetan people, of the Tibetan people to the world, um, sustained by its parliament in exile, which we claim, which we uh, recognize and respect and believe every country should do so as well. Uh, conscious of the need that exists to take measures, uh, protective and defensive measures, that have the uh, objective to resolve the conflict, the Sino-Tibetan con uh, conflict, which since 1960 escalated to a conflict of uh, international importance as it involves elements that violate human rights of the Tibetan people. We exhort the recognition and uh, the guaranteeing of human rights, basic human rights to the Tibetan people on behalf of the uh, Popular Republic of China. We exhort uh, the People's Republic of China abstain from intervening in succession processes of religious authorities, respecting the freedom, uh, the religious freedom of all Tibetans. At the same time, we demand the liberation, immediate liberation, of the Pachan Lama and his family, unjustly detained by Chinese authorities. We ask the international community to act with the uh, goal of promoting dialogue between the parties in the search for a pacific resolution of the Sino-Tibetan conflict under the principles of international law, human rights, and democratic participation and international cooperation. We commit to uh, add more Latin American countries to this cause and to uh, transfer this message to others um, that Tibet is not and never has been a part of the PRC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnny Wright and your colleagues, uh, four parliamentarians from El Salvador, five from Chile, and uh, one from uh, Mexico. A big round of applause for all 10 of them, please. As we see that we meet to part, and we part to meet. Uh, we came here with a common goal of uh, showing our solidarity for a great cause of Tibet. And now it has, is coming to the end. When Tibet was first invaded in 1959, and since then in exile, the Tibetan community as an institution, as an individual, and NGOs, we try to uh, tell to the world that you cannot trust China because China has a teeth to show and teeth to eat. Barely, 
Nobody listened to Tibet. Everyone was so mesmerized by the, uh, the show of uh, the power and kind of development at the surfacial uh, site of Tibet. But nobody could fathom the rotten, the smell that is underneath the crust of that shining uh, development. But with the advent of Wuhan COVID-19, the world has come in terms with the reality how far China's leadership can go for their end met. So we are happy that the human right and the liberty and the freedom each one of us enjoy, you cannot take it for granted. When we went for the Tibet advocacy, we told them, today it is us. Tomorrow it could be you. Today we need you, tomorrow you could need us. And the reality is before us. With the expansionist mentality of Xi Jinping, no one is safe. No one. I mean, the dream of Xi Jinping is to rejuvenate China in 2035. So that means that China dreamed to either surpass or level their power of uh, international affairs to the United States. So that is the dream of Xi Jinping. So according to that dream, we must work harder. So therefore, I'm taking the liberty of changing the roll calling of thank you because I know that each one of you, you have contributed immensely here, leaving a lot of uh, your assignment at home, giving priority for the cause of Tibet, giving priority for the cause of human right, giving priority for the survival of a nation, a national that has a very rich cultural heritage to give to the world. In this turmoil of war, in this turmoil of greed, the only thing that can pacify and keep calm the heart of leadership is Buddhism. Contentment. I mean, if you keep on drinking salty water, you will never be contented with drinking, I don't know how much, gallons of salty water. Therefore, the need for the world community to come together. Now, Tibet is the guinea pig of nonviolence. When we talk about nonviolence, when we talk about dialogue with China, there are certain sections of people who think that the patterns are very covered. It is the courage of the patterns. It is the guidance of His Holiness that we the patterns have drawn that courage of living with the invaders to coexist with them. We don't blame the Chinese people. They are as victimized as the patterns are. When we were meeting with the Chinese uh, nationals here, somebody asked me, how come you can smile and talk with Chinese people who have invaded your country, who is giving a lot of suffering to your Tibetans? And I told her, it's not the Chinese people. They are victimized like Tibetans. It's the wrong policy of the leadership the greed of the leadership, the greed of Xi Jinping, that is making the Tibetans suffer in their own land. Therefore, your coming over here and showing solidarity for Tibet will be exemplified for all the striving nations like Uyghur, Inner Mongolia, our friends of Hong Kong, 
our friends of Taiwan. So let's pull our strength together. I mean, we, why we have come here all the way from India in America? We believe when we, all of us heard about the Speaker Pelosi speaking, when we heard the Chairman McGovern speaking, it was just overwhelming for me. When Jim McGovern made the remark that Tibet is not a flavor of the month, it's still echoing in my, in my ear. The survival of any nation or any national is not a flavor for a month. Therefore, as per this, we must all strive harder. Not falling into the petty local politics, let us all pull our strength for a common cause. <coughs> so let this be the start to work and collaborate with the like-minded Hong Kong cars, Yukors, and the Taiwanese brothers. I'm sorry. So I think from here, when we go back to our country, let us make sure that each one of us we are going to nurture more youngsters to be the force of nonviolence, to be the force of peace, to be the force of truth. Because as uh, Richard Kerr very rightly said, the truthfulness, nonviolence doesn't have a residue. If you, His Holiness always mentioned, if you are supporting Tibet, you are not against China. You are supporting truth. I mean, we don't disagree that China is becoming powerful, but let us make China powerful with full responsibility. I mean, it's in the interest of the world that we make China responsible. It is signatory to a number of universal declaration. It's, a, it's in the Human Rights Council, but the record of China's human rights in Tibet is the lowest in the world. So this shows that we being complacent to what China says, we have emboldened them to tell more lies. Therefore, I take this my honor and privilege to thank each one of you with my folded hand on behalf of Tibetan Parliament that your coming over here means a lot for the Tibet and for the Tibetans. Your coming over here has sent a message to the communist leadership that Tibet case is not forgotten, that Tibet is not alone. And with this, we are sending message to our suffering Tibetans inside Tibet that we are their voice in exile and will collaborate with the like-minded and the truthful people to come together and join the fight of truth. And let's hope that in the coming centuries, more and more people will come in terms with the, the reality of the world and be the force of the truth. And I also want to thank each and every one of you who have been here in the panel discussion, who have given a lot of contribution, who have enhanced your perspective on Tibet, your perspective on democracy. And the one most uh, pressing issue is about environment. His Holiness also 
always mentioned, the issue of Tibet could be solved if there is sincerity in the minds of the Chinese leadership. But the destruction of environment, which is concerned with the humanity, cannot be rectified. Therefore, the Tibetan nomads, who are having a lot of information and knowledge how to survive in the fragile Himalayan pasture, they are being recruited in the, in the buildings, concrete buildings. And they have a very fascinating term for this, ecological civilization. When you think of this ecological civilization, you will think that China is preserving environment to the extent that they are driving away the nomads of Tibet from their pasture land. But the reality is that is a means to drive away the Tibetan nomads who are the saviors of the fragile Himalayan pasture. And now, since they are being resettled in the concrete buildings, they label them as surplus human resource. They don't have a livelihood. The nomads don't have a livelihood. They have to make their kids means for livelihood for one and two dollars each. Now this is what China is trying to project to the world. <coughs> Therefore, Therefore, His Holiness has told, Tibet being the roof of the world. If the roof of the world itself is leaky, how can you fix the world as the home of humanity? So the knowledge of the nomads of Tibet and the ecological importance of the Tibet plateau needs to be understood and given a due share at the international uh, environment conferences. It's not Tibet, it's for the whole humanity because of the roof of the world is leaky. Therefore, each one of us, we must take this message from here that it is for the humanity that Tibet Plato needs to be given the importance it really deserves. So I can just go on and on, but uh, you don't need a lecture or any of this. This is just for my satisfaction that I'm crying from this pulpit. So forgive me for that. I'm not trying to educate the honorable parliamentarians. This is the cry of a Tibetan uh, soul who's trying to represent the people inside Tibet. So I thank you, each and every one, to be here when we worked out this uh, Eighth World Parliamentarians, the Tibetan Parliamentarians, the Kashak, the Sikyong, and uh, the Minister of Information, uh, all of us, we worked as a team, a unified team. Each one of us, we, are trying, we try to figure out how best we can convene this. Therefore, I would like to thank Sikyong, Department of Information Minister Nunzinla, and all the 13 Office of Tibet representatives who have really worked hard to pull out the parliamentarians to the Washington, D.C. So without your uh, cooperation, it would not be uh, I mean, the attendance may, may not be this convincing. So thank you so much for this. And then one thing, when we are working on Tibet, we have to work with a number of stakeholders. Uh, we worked with ICT. We worked with uh, NAT. We worked with NDI, who were really promising try, to try to figure out how best they can finance, because we are in exile. We don't have the source of income to 
facilitate each and everything. So we have to figure out how best we can make this possible. So in this uh, course of event, without finance, it would not be possible. So uh, NET and NTI, despite having a lot of obstacles and challenges of clauses of uh, uh, the rule of law, we try to figure out and try to figure out how best you can uh, finance this uh, WPCT. So uh, from the Tibetan Parliament, I would like to thank uh, Nat and uh, NGI. Did I miss anything else? Uh huh. Okay. Uh huh. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, many, uh, we come from different backgrounds and we speak different languages. Uh, many of my parliamentarians. Uh, uh, needed English translation. At the same time, our Spanish and our, our French parliamentarians needed uh, translation on that. So we had a number of volunteers like uh, Tenzin Jigmela, uh, the vice president of... Uh, uh? Okay. Uh, and uh, Tenzin Barshila, also pres uh, president, and uh, he did the French translation. Jigmela did the Tibetan translation, and Mario did the Spanish translation. So a big round of applause for all of them. <laughs> and one thing that we have to rectify and change in future is about uh, what Shashi Thururji told. It's the time of media. It's the time of social media. So we are missing the international media here when we are having such an uh, important uh, convention on Tibet. So we have the uh, media like Voice of uh, America, Radio Free Asia, Tibet Online, uh, Voice of Tibet, uh, but uh, the international media is missing. So these are things that we have to take care of later on. I mean, uh, when we have any such kind of convention, we need to figure out how best we can pull the international media, both print and uh, the social media, so that we have more coverage, so that more people understand what's going on here and how many participants of countries are here and how are they showing solidarity for the cause of Tibet. So these are the things we have to learn. I'm sure there are so many uh, drawbacks and loopholes that we need to learn. And uh, I hope that uh, we will connect with you for future reference of uh, uh, improvement, if there is any. Uh, we are always here to receive suggestions. And for the friends of Yukor, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Inner Mongolia, I think it's, I always tell uh, whenever I meet Tibetan people, it is not just a, a official conferences that we share. It's like day-to-day -day life. We have to have connections built. This is just symbolic, passing a resolution. But each day, each one of us, we give a visiting card, your numbers, your social media account, and we need to connect with each other every day. What's happening in your country, what's happening in Tibet, what's happening in Mongolia, and what's happening in the rest of the world. Because the world politics is very volatile. So each one of us, we have to take care of the world scenario and try to navigate how best we can showcase our suffering, our truth, and our uh, cause in the international arena. So uh, without taking much of your time, I hope I have not left anyone. And I'll beg your pardon if I left anyone. Uh huh. Tibet online. Okay. Uh, last but not the least, our drafting committee, 
who were present in the uh, conference, at the same time, you have to put your hat in how best you can draft for the uh, convention, because this is the result of two days talking. So each one of you, you have contributed. And Michael, he, was, uh, he had done the maximum, not only in producing the, uh, the resolution of this convention, but he was pioneer in taking out the handbook that each one of us have in our folder. So I beg each one of you to keep this handbook with you all the time, read it, go through it. It has the purpose, the focus, and the action, what you can do. Try to figure out how best we can bring not just humanitarian sympathy and support for Tibet, but how best you can take out policies and uh, I mean, acts for the cause of the human suffering. Uh, that's very important. So just now we had the, uh, the El Salvador, Chile, and Mexico showing their solidarity. Uh, it's the first time that, uh, that we had the representation of Latin America, but they have showed to all of us that if you have a will, you can do things together. So let's hope that each one of us, after going from here, let's figure out how best, uh, because the common people can show sympathy, but it is the parliament who build policies and who enact laws, they can do maximum to show the real sense of uh, power to the communist regime. So with this note, uh, uh, I end with the saying that a friend in need is a friend indeed. So the friends of Tibet are here when the f Tibetans need you. So I thank you for the, from the bottom of my heart, and I thank you uh, from the Tibetan parliament and of my own uh, for a very healthy life to all of you, for a very happy and uh, a very successful political career so that the suffering of humanity can be taken care of at the highest level for all the striving nations. Thank you so much, Tashi Dele. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, Thomas Hering Law of the Tibetan Parliament in Exile. So this brings us to a close of this eighth World Parliamentarian Convention on Tibet here in Washington, DC. We have one more announcement at 7 p.m. We have a closing dinner hosted by the Tibetan Parliament in Exile. So please, everybody, 7 p.m. at the concourse room. We'll see you there. Thank you.